Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Max Min, Mathematics and Computer Science for Materials Innovation. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Marjorie Seneschal from Smith College in the US. Marjorie will talk today about a very interesting question. Are there five parallelohedra or is there only one? Over to you, Marjorie, please. Thank you. Thank you, Vitaly. Uh, the question is sort of a joke. Of course, there are five. Uh, but there are, in some sense, there's only one. And I, I'm really talking mostly today about the hat and some of the questions that it raises. And that includes questions about parallelohedra that I think are interesting. So, uh, but most of this work is very new. And uh, the papers about the hat, as you'll see, have not been published yet. So there's still a lot of, of questions out there. And I hope you'll ask some of them, and I can't promise to answer them. But anyway, let's proceed and see. So I'll begin now. This is the front page. Let's go to the next. And there are three parts to this talk, um, background, foreground, and playground. And I'll start with the background. And the background <clears throat> starts with things that you all know. And that is uh, the old theories of crystal structure, the ancient theories that go way, way back. Uh, this, is, this is a picture of many, many crystals. This is a display that's at the Mining Institute in St. Petersburg. Beautiful thing here you see parts of the, the, the uh, mine shafts, and this whole thing is meant to reproduce a mine shaft, and then with the crystals all on the outside rather than on the inside. It's a beautiful thing. And the uh, early theories about the, the forms, the striking polyhedral forms, were that the crystals are made of some sort of brick uh, stacked together, which can finish be set, finished off in various different ways. So here you see a uh, bricks being stacked into a rhombic dodecahedron, and here they're being, um, what is this? Uh, this is a pyridohedron. And uh, as you know, you can finish off a stack in many different ways, but with the same bricks. And then there may be different kinds of bricks. And this was Ari, Ari in France, 1801, who first drew these pictures and many more and has a whole book explaining crystal structure and crystal form on the basis of stacked bricks. Um, the This became much more precise with, the Russian mineralogist E.S. Fedorov, um, who showed that there are five combinatorial types of bricks. And by brick, he meant a convex polyhedron that fills space by translation. And he called them parallelohedra because the polyhedra are arranged in parallel position. And so he showed there are five combinatorial types. We'll look at those in a minute. Um, uh, so to, to get those five, um, he argued that parallelohedra and and their faces, the two-dimensional faces, must be central symmetric. We know now that it's enough just that the center, faces are central symmetric. That implies that the polyhedron is also, but he didn't know that. So he argued the parallelohedra, these are the polyhedra, and their, their two-dimensional faces are central symmetric, and he called polyhedra with these properties zonohedron. Uh, he, better off, this is the same one who enumerated the 230 space groups. And he made many contributions in mineralogy, and he was the Mining Institute's first elected rector uh, in 1905. Um, the faces of a zonohedron, this was his, his big insight, lie in belts, or what he called them zones, or circuits of parallel edges. And that belts include the faces to which those edges belong. And the length of a belt is the number of edges or faces, same thing in it. So if you, for example, a hexagonal prism, uh, has three belts of length four. So if you go across a hexag the hexagonal face uh, and then down across the the uh, uh, quadrilateral and then the other hexagonal face and then back up, whoops, excuse me, let's go. Uh, back up, you have a length four circling this way. If you go around the hexagonal way, you have six edges six faces, six quadrilateral faces, and that's a belt of length six. So the hexagonal prism has Three belts of length four, one of belt six, and that's it. The length of length six, that's it. Uh, and any zonohedron, you can count the number of edges and faces. And there are all kinds of mathematical relationships between the numbers of faces and the number of zones. And Fedorov approved most of those things, but we won't use those today. Um, over time, um, they have been completely characterized in, in any dimension, arbitrary dimension, starting with him, but going through Minkowski, Delaunay, Alexandrov, Coxeter, McMullen, and others. The theorem, we won't worry about who actually did what, uh, but it states that a convex polyhedron um, in D dimensions is a parallelotope. That means a parallelohedron, but in D dimensions, if and only if it's a zonotope 
and all its belts have length four or six. And that was but if and only if. This is quite a remarkable statement. Um, so for example, the regular dodecahedron and the rhombic tricotahedron are both convex central symmetric polyhedron, but neither one is a parallelohedron. So why isn't this one? What's wrong here? You know, I'll... Not central symmetric faces. What? <laughs> I didn't hear you. I can. May I answer? Nikolai Petrovich, please. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, it doesn't uh, satisfy the first uh, condition. Uh, it's not right. on the top. That's right. It does. This does not satisfy the first condition because. And the and the concept uh, the concept of the belt uh, is not applied to, to this um, polyhedron. So this doesn't belt? have all belts, right? Because they, this isn't central symmetric. Exactly. Thanks, Kolya. So these are with pentagons, it's not central symmetric. And so this is, even though it's a, uh, uh, it's convex and it's sent, the polyhedron central symmetric, the faces are not. So <coughs> that's why this is not a, a parallel, a parallel. Mm -hmm. And this one here, what's the problem with this? This is the rhombic tricontahedron. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see here. The belt. But, it, it belt is too long. What? Belts are too long. Yes, exactly. The belts are too long. If you trace them around, which you can't do here very well, but they're length 10. They're all length 10. So that's that's what he's excluding. He's excluding things like this and things like this. Uh, but if they are zonotopes and if their belts are length four or six, then they're a parallelotope and they tile space, whatever dimension you're in. Uh, <clears throat> so then Fedorov was able to drive all, all five types. Uh, these are again combinatorial types. So they don't have to have exactly these shapes, uh, but they. Um, this could be a rhombohedron, for example. Um, but anyway, these are the five types: parallel piped, hexagonal prism, a truncated octahedron, rhombic dodecahedron, and the elongated rhombic dodecahedron, uh, it, which is elongated that these vertices are split and these become one circuit becomes hexagons instead of uh, rhomb rhombuses. And I'm using this this abbreviations P for the parallel piped, H P T O R D, and E D just for convenience. So these are his combinatorial types. And one thing that uh, is this is a well known fact, but I think we can make much more of it than than has been done in the past. Um, these five combinatorial types of parallelhedra are related uh, by a process called belt contraction. And uh, what that means is to, to shrink one belt to zero, once the edges of one belt at a time to zero. So if we look at the truncated octahedron, it has six, six uh, belts, they're all equivalent by symmetry. They're all of length six, and I've marked them in with different colors here. So we see one, the green one goes this way. Whoops, to go back. Green one goes this way. The bright blue goes this way, the dark blue goes this way, the gray, this, you can see that pink. And each one is a belt. And I hope I've done this right. So you can see how they circle and circle the whole thing. Um, now, contraction means to shrink one of those to zero. So here, if we look at the green belt, uh, the green edges, and shrink them to zero, we end up with this and bring the paces together. So we shrink those to zero and move at the same time, bring the these extant faces, the ones that are still there together so that they fit together, which they do. Then you, you shrink this becomes the elongated dodecahedron. So here's a circuit of, will be a circuit of six, uh, four, um, four hexagons, and then <clears throat> the other uh, eight are quadrilaterals. So that's, that's what happens if you shrink one belt, any one of them, you will end up with an elongated dodecahedron just like this. Um, now you can take the elongated dodecahedron and shrink its edges, so its belt. So here, take the orange belt, shrink it, and you end up with a hexagonal prism here. Here's the hexagons, and then these are quadrilateral faces surrounding it. Um, here, if you take the elongated dodecahedron again and shrink the hexagonal faces, down, they become quadrilaterals, and we end up with a rhombic dodecahedron. So from the one, from the elongated dodecahedron, we can get either of these two types. 
And now we proceed with these types uh, shrinking uh, one of its uh, belts, and we end up with the parallel with the um, <clears throat> basically the rhombohedron of the cube. Um, parallel pipette. And then the same thing here with the rhombic dodecahedron, we shrink one of its uh, belts, we end up also. These are combinatorially equivalent, even though metrically they're not. So that this is what I meant by the question, is there just one? Because they all belong to a family. And it's a, whether it's a happy family or not is a different question, but it is a family. And you can get one from the other by edge reduction, edge shrinking. Um, and so maybe there's just one. And it depends on how we want to classify these things. Um, and so here's my chart showing how they all fit together by this process of zone <coughs> contraction. Now, Fedorov uh, had a concept of crystal structure. He, uh, his, his theory was that a crystal um, is made of molecules and the molecules are, the crystal can be partitioned into parallelohedra. That's why he was interested in the parallelohedra was to partition the crystals into them and then he partitioned the parallelohedra into what he called stereohedra. And the stereohedra each contained a single molecule in his view. So we had the molecules joining into parallelohedra, the, the stereohedra, and then they formed together the big crystal here. And this is what the structure actually looked like then. So the structure was made of parallelohedra, which were decomposed into stereohedra. And this is, he wrote an enormous book called The Crystal Kingdom, only in German, uh, Das Kristallreich. Uh, showing how this worked for every single crystal that he knew. And unfortunately, it, it wasn't true. Um, what happened was the X-ray diffraction was discovered. And with the X-ray diffraction, one could read backwards and discover the structure of the crystals. And it quickly disproved his structure theory. Uh, <clears throat> so you see that the X-rays are being uh, diffracted by the, by the rows of the molecules. And then you get a pat X-ray pattern, pattern, as you all know with bright spots, we'll come back to that too. So they disproved the structure theory because they showed in fact that there are no, not necessarily any molecules in a crystal. And the first structure to be determined uh, was actually halite or common salt. And W.L. Bragg showed that you cannot group the atoms into molecules um, because each sodium atom is equally related to all six surrounding chlorine atoms and vice versa. So there are no molecule parts you can do it, but it's artificial. And so that the structure theory was not, not correct. And Fedorov was a very nice person and he lived to see this result and he acknowledged it very gracefully. And so his life's work <coughs> went to the history shelves. So that's the background. And now I wanna move into the foreground, um, which is the discovery of aperiodic crystals. Uh, so stereohedra became history but periodicity still held sway. The idea that uh, a parallelohedra and periodicity still held sway. And the theorem that was called the crystallographic restriction <coughs> was taught and still is taught actually uh, in mineralogy classes around the world. Um, it says that a periodic tiling of the plane or three space cannot have five-fold rotational symmetry nor seven, eight, anything greater than six. It only can have two, three, four, and six-fold. We all know this and it's a very simple thing to prove. And uh, this is a mathematical theorem, it's not a crystallographic theorem, the, um, but it was thought for a long time that it was actually a fact about crystals too. So I don't, can you see over here, can you see the various, these are the lattices, the two dimensions, of course, there are 14 and three dimensions. Uh, and what, I'm, what I've got here is showing why uh, there, we have this, this restriction, because if you have a lattice, um, then between, there is a minimum distance between points, and let's assume that you have rotations at those points of five, five-fold. Uh, so choose this one, this one, a minimum distance apart. And now rotate around this, you get five. And rotate now around this one, and you get five. But then look and see, we have these two. They don't meet together, they're, but their distance is closer than the minimum distance. So this is impossible. If this had been 60 degrees, these would have met at the top, and there would have been no problem. If it had been 90 degrees, there would have been no problem. But because of 72 degrees, we have a, di a interpoint distance that's smaller than the minimum. And so we have a contradiction. And so that is the all there is to the proof of the crystallographic restriction. Um, and uh, this is just to show you, this is the Alhambra Palace in Spain, one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. And 
there's not a square inch of that, except maybe on some of the sides here, that isn't filled with some pattern of some sort. Uh, th this is a big building, not just one room. Uh, and you can see all these tilings of beautiful tiles all over the place. And each one ha has a pattern that has a lattice behind it. And each one has is periodic. And it's natural to sort of assume that if you can tile any surface of uh, plane or even three dimensions uh, at all, you can do it periodically like this. And so that was actually a conjecture by Hao Wang in 1961, that if a set of tiles can tile the plane, as he said, in any fashion whatsoever, uh, you can also do it, range it, so that you get a periodic pattern. And that was assumed to be a reasonable conjecture, except that um, five years later, his student, Robert Berger, disproved it. And he disproved it, <clears throat> as we all know, with a set of tiles that can tile only non-periodically. This was kind of hard to find and kind of hard to play with because the first number of tiles in his set was 20,426. So this is unlike the hat, which we'll come to shortly, this is not the kind of tiling set that you can sit around on your kitchen table with and play with and see, oh, this is how it works and that's how it works. This was totally theoretical, but nevertheless, was, he was able to prove it. And so uh, <clears throat> that disproved Wang's conjecture. And the question arose immediately, uh, is there a shorter, smaller set than 20,426? And Wang himself was able to, I mean, Berger, I mean, Berger himself was able to bring it down to 100. And then other people got it to 50 and so forth and down. And then finally, uh, <clears throat> in 19, um, early, early 70s, um, Penrose found four and then he got it down to two. And so the famous Penrose tiles were the last of, up until now in this series of reduction of trying to get smaller and smaller sets that tile the plane only, only non-periodically and cannot tie it. And this was Martin Gardner who announced this in Scientific American in 1975. So this took about 10 years to get from those 20,000 down to two. Um, and here's a picture of a patch of Penrose tiling I stole it off the web. Unfortunately, it's it's central, it's symmetrically fivefold rotation, but that doesn't harm anything. It just it's not usual. Most patches of the Penrose tile don't have any symmetry at all. But this is fine. This is correct. What you have here are the two, this is the rhombus version of it. And these rhombs are actually, we have to think of them as either having notches or having the arcs, uh, colored arcs. And the rule is for putting them together is that this have to fit together. So this notch here has to go into one like this. This has to fit into one like this. And these notches are the, or the, the colors have to match one or the other. And this forces does not permit anything like this. You cannot put these together to form a periodic pattern. So it's the notches that make the difference. It's not the shapes. And you can't do something like this. And you can see here, if you just look at this a little more, um, let's take, for example, the five-pointed stars. Um, there's some more. Um, if this was hmm, periodic, you would have from here to here, there'd be another one right there, but there's not. Uh, and let's just get a few more and see how they spring up, things like this. And then here's, for example, putting a line through two that are identical, but there's no third one there. And this one here is a little bit off center, so it doesn't lie on this line and so forth. So these are, you all know this, and, and I don't need to go through it, but I just wanted to remind you of the fact that this is, was quite remarkable. It spread around the world. Everybody was very excited about it and still is wonderful. And it has also um, been a big, big um, a player, I think, in the history of crystallography. Um, they were thought to be disordered because they weren't periodic. But, um, and you can see all these fivefold points. This is a picture of the vertices of the Penrose tiles that was drawn by Alan Mackay. Um, they, the five folds everywhere, they're not periodic. That meant disorder. Um, but Alan Mackay, who was very clever and is, um, showed that order and periodic were not synonymous. And the way he did that was to make a, a diffraction mask, optical diffraction mask up at these points, uh, at all of these, these circular points, and which is the pen, basically, essentially the Penrose tiling vertices. It, it's hard to see it, but that's basically what it is. And he was able to get a diffraction pattern 
with sharp bright spots in it, which is an indication of order or is maybe a proof of order. And so that showed that they were not talking, order and periodic are not synonymous. And this, this was, uh, he presented this at the, in 1981 at the International Union of Crystallography meeting in Ottawa, Canada. Nobody had ever seen anything like it before. But then the, the very next year, um, aperiodic crystals were discovered, which are very much like it. And as we all know, then the subject opened up and period periodicity became a very important special case, but not the entire story about crystal structure. And so that was a final blow to Fedorov's theory of the parallelohedra and the, and the stereohedra, but then maybe not quite. So, and then Dan, we know Dan Sheckman got the Nobel Prize in 2011 for his discovery. Uh, so then the question became, and uh, is there a single tile? We've got two, that's Penrose's. Are there, is there maybe one that tiles only non-periodically? Is there an aperiodic monotile? And Ludwig Danzer called this an Einstein, meaning a single stone. Uh, and it's a cute joke, so we continue to call it the Einstein. Uh, so is there one? And people began searching for that. Um, and I think many people, including me, thought there probably wasn't any, no such thing. But nevertheless, <clears throat> they searched for it and found one. Um, 1993. This was a process of three different people working on it in, in over time. Uh, Peter Schmidt at the University of Vienna uh, described a non-convex space filler, and then uh, Conway took that and changed it into a made it into a biprism um, that was convex. And then Danzer perfected that a little bit. We won't need, don't need to go into the details, but the result end result was that you you could tile space with this thing. Um, and it was aperiodic. It was easy to show it's aperiodic or non-periodic. And uh, so there it was, except that everybody said, that's not what we were looking for. Now, they hadn't said before what they were looking for. Nobody had, had been so precise about that. They just knew that when you saw this one, it's not what we're looking for. What's wrong with this one, what bothered people about it was that they, it's made of layers and the layers themselves are periodic. The layers are perfectly two-dimensional translations. But then the third layer, or the next the layer above it, uh, has to be at an angle that's irrational. And then you begin to get an irrational spiral, and that cannot be a periodic tiling. So it doesn't tile space periodically, three space, but each layer itself is periodic. So that's not what we were looking for. We now know that. So we've got to find something that doesn't do that. And then 2011, Joshua Sokolar, uh, and Joan Taylor, who is an amateur mathematician in Australia, uh, found one that uh, doesn't have that problem. This is their hexa hexagons. Um, and this, the different colors, the different tiles, and these tile only non-periodically. I mean, they're, they're all the same. I'm sorry, they're meant to distinguish them. They're all, these are all the same uh, geometrically. Uh, but, but this isn't what we were looking for either, everybody said. And they knew that too. I mean, why why weren't we looking for this? Well, this is because each color here uh, represents a single tile. So the tile has many pieces. Though, for example, you take the red one here, that's part of it, that's part of it, that's part of it, that's part of it. If you lift this up and move it, they all come with you. But they're, they're as if they were linked by some magical force or some, some, uh, some bond, but they are in pieces. And people realized they didn't want a tile that was in pieces, they wanted a single tile. And so suddenly we weren't looking for this either, even though no one had said that before. And this is another version of theirs um, and where the where tiles meet at, in just points and that we don't want that either. So this isn't what we're looking for, but now it, we found what we're looking for. Uh, it's a hat or some people say it's a shirt, uh, but everybody agrees this is Einstein. And this is just now, this was posted on an archive in, on March 20th. So where are we now? It's been just two months. And this thing has gone viral worse than COVID. I mean, not worse, but more. Faster than COVID has spread around the world has this thing gone everywhere. Uh, this was by David Smith, Samuel Myers, Craig Kaplan, and Chaim Goodman Strauss. They're the four authors of this. And here, here's a patch of, their, of the tiling. They use different colors just to distinguish them so you can see them better. Um, no notched edges no skewed layers, and only one piece. And not only that, they gave two proofs of aperiodicity, two very different proofs. 
uh, which we were not going to go over today, but you can, I'll give you the reference at the end and you can go read it, uh, read them. Uh, so this was quite something. And uh, the uh, New York Times gave it a whole page, which I think sets a record for a mathematical discovery. Um, and it is elusive Einstein solves a longstanding math problem. And it all began with a hobbyist messing about and experimenting with shapes because it was discovered actually by David Smith. And he was just doing that, messing about and experimenting with shapes. Um, and there's a lot of theory that you can invoke here, but he wasn't using it. He was just messing about with shapes. Uh, moreover, and this is really amazing, uh, he and his colleagues showed, uh, because I should have said a minute ago, Smith was not a, is not a mathematician, but he knew some. And so when he realized that he was onto something, because he was messing about with his hat, and he found he could tile part of the plane, and it, but it wasn't repeating in any way, he began to get suspicious that maybe he had found the Einstein, and he got in touch with Craig Kaplan, who was his friend, and then they got in touch with Samuel Myers and Chaim, and together they were all able to prove this. Um, and they found more than that. And one thing they showed is that the hat belongs to a continuum of aperiodic monotiles. And you can see this by a process very much like the zone, zone, delete, zone, zone contraction, except this is not a zonagon. This does not have central symmetry, nothing like that, but it has edges of two different lengths. It has the green edges, which are, if the, if the brown ones are length one, then the green are square root three. Um, and this is length two. Um, so it has a, one, length, one edge of length two, but count it, think of it as two edges of length one. And then the brown edges are also length one. And then the green edges are length square three. If you shrink the brown and the blue, because they're really brown, uh, to zero, you get this shape. And you can see that here because you're bringing these together, so forth. And if you shrink the green edges to zero, you get this shape. And both of these tile the plane periodically. Um, pan, yeah, tile the plane periodically. Um, if you take them out of this context and just play with them, you can easily tile, but that's not the point. So the point is that anyway, if you shrink the, the brown and blue edges to zero, you get this. And if you shrink the green to, to this, you get this. And you can do this continuously. So watch, this is Craig Kaplan's animation. So as, as the edges shrink and, 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 and emerge, we move from one of those two final shapes to the other. And then we go back again. And you see somewhere along in the middle, it becomes looking more and more like the hat. And the hat appears in the middle there somewhere. And then we get back to this other one. And all of the, all of those at any point, and you should download this if you're interested, you can download it from Craig's website. Uh, and play with it and stop it and, and study it, you see that none of the, the configurations around each other don't change. None of the, the tiles are all grouped in the same way. Uh, they share the same edges or whatever. And so that if this is, if one of them is aperiodic, the others, non-periodic, the others are also. So we're going through a continuum, each one of these tiles until you get to the endpoints, these, and there's one in the middle also, uh, all but three of them in that whole sequence are aperiodic tiles, and it's quite amazing to see it. So anyway, here it is. Um, let's see if we can, wait, I didn't mean to start that again, but watch it once more. And I'll do this by hand. See, they're keeping their neighbors, and that's what that's what's the basis of the proof of the aperiodicity, is how they're grouped together, the clusters. And those don't change. It's just the shapes of the individual tiles are changing. So here we go. Next, hey, there we go. Okay. Um, so as we've seen, Fedorov's five also belong to such a family. So if there's one family of aperiodic tiles, there's one family of parallelhedra and we can decide what we mean by one and who, how big is a one and so forth. Uh, so let's take Fedorov's five off the shelf and look at them with fresh eyes and with new tools like animation. So I wish, I can't do it, I don't know how, but somebody should be able to do a 3D animation of what I showed you before of these all blending into one another by 
the contraction of the edges that should be possible to do. And it would be very interesting to see that. Um, so now let's come to the playground. And just in the spirit of David Smith, let's just play with these things. Um, there, is a, there is theory you can prove with proving the aperiodicity requires a lot of background uh, information about the way that tiles group and the way that the, the hierarchical structures and so on. But let's leave that aside and just play with these things. Um, get the spirit from uh, this wonderful book, uh, Tilings and Patterns. It's quite old now. It was in the 70s. <laughs> Tilings and Patterns by Grunbaum and Shepard, uh, which is still the Bible of uh, tilings and patterns in the plane. And one of the problems that they pose is this one, um, which they say the 24 heptiamonds. Now, what is a heptiamond? A heptiamond is seven equilateral triangles merged together. And it, I haven't proved it, but they claim, and I'm sure it's true, that there are exactly 24 different ones up to symmetry. Uh, and here, here they are. And uh, these are all, and so the question was that the, here is that are these actual tiles? Do these tile the plane or don't they tile the plane? Uh, and this was posed by someone named Byrne, O'Byrne, and he, um, Gregory, this is a, quoting from the book. This is a, a page from the book. Gregory Bishop showed that only one of them is not. So look at these. I, we won't, don't need to do that right now with any length of time, but just look at them and see. Uh, if you can think quickly, which one might not be uh, the tile. And then since this is being recorded, you can look at it again, or if you have this book, just do it yourself. It's kind of fun to, to figure out which one of these uh, is not a tile. And the, more importantly, th that the others are. Um, so, but look at it this way. This is the way, uh, sort of the Federoff way of looking at it. Let's think of the tile. These are tr equilateral triangles. This, these are exactly the same. Some These are seven of the, same ones. Um, I remember, how many did I put here? Three, six, nine, 10, 11. 11 of the 24. Um, the same ones that are in the previous page. And I wanted to show you this is a tiling by hexagons, which is divided up into uh, stereogons, if you want to think of it that way. So the hexagonal tiling can be divided up into triangles. And that's what we have here. And these are some pieces of them. These are some stereohedra or stereogons that are put together, uh, that, that's exactly the same, they were all in the previous slide. And here you see them, and the question becomes now, which clusters of seven stereogons are two-dimensional monotiles? And here you see this one, for example, it's very easy to, um, to stack two together this way, you know, by mirror reflection, and then we obviously can tile the plane with that. This one here, I've just done this for fun, I'll put them here and you could, they, you could make a six-fold rotation center and then you can continue that around and tile the plane with this. And you can have fun looking at it that way. But I wanted to point out the connection with, uh, over to me, is Fedorov's stereohedra because that's basically what they are and except in the plane. Um, and now there are two ways to, to uh, divide, probably more than that, but at least to the hexagon into stereogons. One is the one I've just showed you, the, the triangles, and the other is this which is kites, they're called kites. And this one, the difference is that instead of connecting the center to the vertices, you connect the center to the midpoints of the edges. When you do that, you get quadrilaterals here in these shapes and these are called kites. So here's the parallelogon, the hexagon uh, divided into triangles and then subdivided into kites. And that's exactly what was being used, what is being used here to find the hat. Um, these, a hat is an octakite. Instead of a heptiamond, it's an octakite. There are eight kites. Um, I imagine somebody has figured out how many octa octakites there are. I have not. But here are three. There's take one, six here in this hexagon and take two neighbors, uh, or take six, four, three from a hexagon and six neighbors, whatever. Uh, there we have, an, um, here are just three examples of octakites. And I don't know how many there are altogether. There, there are lots. But one of them, here is the hat. So the hat is sitting here, right here in, in the hexagons, and it's just been there all the time. Uh, and suddenly it's been discovered. Uh, so the question's really an interesting one. How many octakites are there? Uh, which of them are monotiles, can tile the plane? And which of those monotiles are aperiodic? And nobody expected there to be one. Uh, but I think David Smith was playing around with octakites 
And he had a, he had some software to do it with, but he was also cutting them out and playing with them and put, pushing them around. And he discovered the hat uh, that way. And it was sitting right there all the time. Um, so why not do the th same thing in three dimensions? And that's really the question I want to pose. Uh, the uh, the <clears throat> these are Fedorov's parallelohedra. They can be stacked in this way. As, this is just from the previous earlier slide. Um, but we can do uh, perform zone contraction on these on the whole tiling at a, at, at a time. And this will go to this, and this one can go to this or to this, and these can all go to this. So we have something interesting going on here that could look very much like the, the animation you saw before. Uh, but at the same time, we'll be getting strange new shapes in the process as this animates and as, as these contract and, and expand. And um, what kinds of new creatures are waiting for us out there? So for example, there are lots of ways we can make a rhombic dodecahedron out of rhombic dodecahedra or out of uh, truncated octahedra, uh, who knows what else. Uh, and we could be taking pieces of these and looking at them to see which ones of those we can mess about with clusters of three-dimensional stereohedra and see what we find. Um, and so I tried to do some with cubes. Uh, can think of five cubes put together and call them pentacubes. I don't know how many there are pentacubes, uh, but here are some examples that I made. And which ones of these are tiles in three-dimensional space and which ones are not? And are any of the pentacubes by any chance aperiodic? I don't know. And you don't have to stop with five. Uh, but I think there's a whole world of interesting questions there that are opened up by looking again at Fedorov's stereohedra idea and looking at uh, the, um, the, the transformations that we get of transforming tilings by zone contraction and seeing what, what lies there and playing with these parts and trying to retile a space with them. So that's those are my questions. And they're all spot, they're all uh, inspired by this hat, which I think is, is really one of the most intriguing little creatures to come along in a long time. It's got 13 edges, a simple polygon, plain polygon, not central symmetric, and look what it's doing. Uh, so these are the questions. Which 3D monotiles now, periodic and aperiodic, are sitting right in the parallelohedra, waiting to be discovered? And here are some sources for you. Uh, the, the These are still just on archive. They have not been published yet. Uh, the two papers, the first one by David Smith and Myers, Kaplan, Good and Strauss is the one that sent all this started. And then a little later, a couple of weeks later, Joshua Sokolar uh, did uh, is put also on archive a very interesting um, study of this from the perspective of quasi crystals. He's able to show what its diffraction pattern is, the and so forth. And it's a very it's a very nice paper. And then there are many websites, and there's all kinds of stuff going on out there all the time. And then this is the paper that um, Gene and I showed the, the contraction <clears throat> of the parallelohedra. In. So that is it, and I'm happy to try to answer questions, but I'd be happy to hear the questions, especially. Thank you very much, Marjorie. <clears throat> Great talk, very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'll stop the recording.